Um, mm -hmm. Okay. We, we, all, we all can hear you, even when you can't hear us. All right. Just kind of like my kids. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Chuck, was there a favorable uh, approval of the minutes? Yes, everybody voted yes. All right, very good. All right, 3.1 is a, a petition for writ of certiorari in the matter of Chad Shelton versus LHPS. Chuck, do you want to take that? Yeah, this was on the agenda last time it was held because it wasn't ready to be on the agenda and it's still not. Um, it, it, I don't know whether it's just going to keep being on the agenda, but we'll, we'll let the people doing the finance minutes know when we think it should be on, so just hold it. All right, can we have a motion to hold? Motion to hold. Motion to hold. Second. All right, all in favor, state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Um, I should have asked, did anyone have any questions? All right. Um, item 3.2 is a resolution supporting a strong state and local partnership regarding shared revenue funds for critical services. It looks like Mayor Vandersteen is at the podium. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The shared revenue program is one of the largest uh, state programs in terms of total funding. It's declined significantly relative to uh, the rest of the state budget over the last 20 years. Over this time, uh, there's been a 12% drop in the amount of uh, funds that support uh, cities, towns, and villages. The current annual payments are based on what's, uh, what the community received in 2013. Uh, for over 100 years, the uh, shared revenue program has been a key component of Wisconsin's system of state and local finance, and it's an important um, part of the state's effort to keep property tax growth under control. Moreover, it's equitable an efficient way to help fund police, fire, streets, and other critical local services, yet the funding for this program has steadily been reduced over the last 20 years. The state cannot profess a commitment to holding down property taxes to continue to decrease and or hold flat shared revenue. It's critical that this program be maintained and the program funding keep pace with the rising cost of providing police, fire, ambulance, street maintenance, elections, and other vital important municipal services. In 2021, the shared revenue payment from the state of Wisconsin to Sheboygan was $10,562,240. Together with the League, we're looking to convince the state legislature to increase payments to cities by at least 2.5%. If we're successful with this and achieve a 2.5% increase in shared revenue, Sheboygan's 22, um, 2022 payment could be increased by $264,056. So I, this uh, resolution is a small part of that effort, but I hope you'll pass this. We'll send it on to the state, along with resolutions coming in from many other cities to try to persuade our legislators uh, to pass such an increase in shared revenue. Thank you. Very good. Um, just to uh, have the uh, matter on the table, is there a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. And is there a second? Second. All right, discussion, questions? All right, well, let me just say, uh, to my astonishment, uh, first of all, I do appreciate the resolution, uh, Mayor Vandersteen. Uh, to my astonishment, um, our legislative leaders have indicated that they just don't know how they're going to use the money that is going to come to the state in light of all of the hardships that we have suffered in the COVID pandemic. May I suggest to them that a small restoration of our shared revenue might be a good place. We talk about a rainy day fund. A rainy day fund is good if your house is in order, if your house is falling down, if the windows aren't sound, if the doors are falling off, if the siding is no good. You may have saved a lot of money, but you haven't saved the things that mean the most. So I am all in favor of this resolution, and I am just hoping that there is enough of a municipal response that we can finally get our legislators attention here. Now you can tell I'm a little charged up about this, but I read these things and I, I get upset. So just to, to emphasize the city is an extremely good steward of the taxpayer funds that we get. It is unfortunate that our property taxes must be so high because our state revenues have not kept pace. So 
Um, in that respect, I am going to be voting for this resolution. <laughs> I'll now get off my soapbox. Um, but is there uh, anyone else who would care to make a comment? Hearing none, all in favor, state aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Chair votes aye. Very good. Let's move on to 3.3, which is a resolution authorizing a budget adjustment and appropriation in the 2021 budget regarding the Senior Activity Center. Who would like to take that? All right. This seems to be essentially a budget adjustment. Is that true, Todd? Would that be a good way of describing it? Yes, Madam Chair. It, it, it's just a budget adjustment with the new Senior Center um, coming on coming online. We're uh, just, again, uh, moving, moving the funds around that we've talked about in the past. All right. Are there any other questions or concerns? I had a question, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you. Uh, when I read this over, uh, Todd, I noticed, uh, I, I, the question I have is, are those two accounts where we're taking the money out of going to be closed down completely, or are we going to leave a few hundred bucks in there just to keep them open? <laughs> The, um, Jim, the, the, I, don't, I don't foresee that the, the funds will actually um, be closed, mainly because right now what we're doing is we're uh, taking those funds from because of the old senior center being closed, and we're transferring those funds to help pay for some, um, some audits that are being done on the new senior center. So knowing that those funds were just going to sit there for the old senior center and not be used, we're just using that, uh, those, those funds to pay for um, items that are needed at the new senior center. In the future, those funds will be for the new senior center versus the old senior center, potentially. So you'll be putting something into janitorial then for the 22 budget and the other one, I, I don't have it in front of me because of my Chromebook. That here, is correct. We'll have to, okay. We will have to have janitorial in the new facility and we'll be reviewing how that, how that facility will be, will be handled um, as well as uh, through DPW. But um, I do foresee that we're gonna have s similar funds for the new senior center as we uh, proceed to close the old senior center. So this will, be, this will if we pass this, this will zero out those accounts for the time being? That is correct. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, could I have a motion to uh, recommend that we receive and adopt the resolution? So moved. Second. There's been a motion and second. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Very good. Let's move on to 3.4, which is a resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a professional services agreement with Carlson Detman Consulting for an assessment of the city's current classification and compensation of its employees. Um, Todd, I assume you'll take this? Yes, I will. Thank and you. And Patrick, do you want to just come up to the microphone? Because I expect folks may have questions or... I have a guarantee. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Go ahead. Thank you, Mary Lynn. Um, just to help kind of guide the, the committee on the presentation, um, uh, Patrick Glenn has brought, uh, from Carlson Detman Consulting, he, he has presented us with a 38-page, or... Uh, slide overview and I, I feel that I'm going to give you the, the, uh, um, the, the slim down um, overview. This, this program has come to the city council in the past, uh, in the years past. So this isn't something that's new. It is something that I've been um, discussing with the council for uh, going on 10 months now. So what we're looking to do is that we are looking to actually do a study on approximately 140 uh, different job descriptions within the city. Um, and as you know, we want, we want the city to be an employer of choice. We want to have gold standards in operations, which you've heard me talk about many, many times. So what the, what the Carlson Detman program that we're presenting to you is going to accomplish is we're going to be looking at our strategy, our expertise, our independence, our access to data. We're going to be unbiased. We're going to be looking at metrics. And we're going to be looking at the, a comprehensive balancing of internal and external pressures that our employees go through. So they're going to be, Carlson Detman's going to be looking at um, the, the actual 
um, operations and the job descriptions that our employees do day in and day out by reviewing what they do with them with some tools that Carlson Detman has in their arsenal. So they'll be doing a job evaluation and that'll include compensation and uh, compensatables. So they'll be looking at the challengings, the problem solving, the decision making that these positions have. They'll be looking at the communication that they have, the work environment, all of the principles that, uh, in, that encompass their job description that they perform day in and day out and how they interact within the different departments. Having that information, they're going to basically look at it from a, a market data, local, regional, uh, you know, national, they're going to be looking at the comparables in the marketplace and the um, competitiveness in the marketplace. So they'll be looking at the market objectives and how that how we how we equal out in there. They'll be looking at the relationship between the pay and the performance. Um, one of the things that you've heard me say is people fill positions. Positions are not made for people. And what I mean by that is over time, job descriptions are adjusted when times are good. And I've seen it in the private sector. And I'm, and I'm seeing it in the, in the municipal sector. So we want to balance that. What's the, what's the performance? What are the, what's the job? And what's the, the value to the city as far as the cost benefit model? So Carlson Detman's going to be taking all of that information, putting together uh, an appropriate job description for the position. And we know that there's going to be positions that we may be able to consolidate. And then they're going to do a market study to say, where is the city? Is the position on the high end, the low end? Are we, are we perfect with how we're compensating? And it's not just hourly, but it's also looking at our other compensation pieces and how, how, we, how we're looking as a community in general. And we have to remember that the municipal market is a, a very tight market as we're finding out. So we obviously need to make sure that we're competitive with our other businesses that we compete against day in and day out. Again, we want the right people in the right place. So I'm asking for your support in this. Um, this is going to help us to have a baseline for years to come so that we can build on this and make sure that our employees are getting the best competitive um, job career for what, for what uh, capabilities and performances that we are expecting in those positions. Are, please let me know if there's any additional questions. All right. Um to get the show rolling, could we have a motion to uh, approve the resolution to engage with professional service agreement uh, uh, with Carlson Detman Consulting? So moved. And is there a second? Second. All right, very good. Questions, comments? I have a question, please. Go ahead. Um, and Todd can probably answer this. In addition to Carlson Detman, how many other firms were investigated and or uh, do we have prior experience with Carlson Detman? Roberta, we did look at two other organizations. Carlson Detman has, has done work for the city in the past. Um, we, we felt that they were the best fit um, for, the, for the details uh, and the, the scope of, of work that they had presented to us. Um, I, as I had stated earlier, they've actually um, presented this, this program to the city years ago, and we just didn't move forward on it. So, again, this is something that I feel, Vicki and I both feel very confident in, that they will do a, a very detailed um, uh, project and scope for us. Uh, for the for the cost and value that we we are expecting. And secondly, what kind of time frame are they giving us for final report? September. I can touch on that. I, our goal um, with any of these, it's it's usually anywhere between a four and six month process, um, and usually those those final couple of months are sifting out details as opposed to collecting major information. So. Our, our primary goal is to make certain that you have a reliable number to plug into your budget when it comes time to make those decisions. So as, as September rolls around, having a placeholder and hopefully as the month of September unfolds, having much more detailed 
allocations for departments and things of that nature. My goal, Roberta, is that we have this all buttoned up by the end of the by the end of the year, which is an aggressive schedule, knowing that we've got 140 job descriptions that we need to look at. Again, we're hoping to have information so that we can move into 2022 a little bit more um, with more clarity. Will will um, individual people be interviewed about what they actually do day to day? on their job yes the actual uh, carlson De uh, Carl <laughs> sorry cunningham butler um carlson detman uh they have actual program and how they work with the employees and basically audit the position um with their what is it jd J let me i guess yeah, yeah go can, ahead yeah because i, I want to be careful with this in terms of interviewing versus inquiring and getting the appropriate information from the employees that if if it was a what I would call an interview process in fact if you're doing what I would call a desk audit and sitting with employees it's going to take somewhere between one and two hours per employee to really do an adequate job and you start multiplying that over towards the number of jobs and I think it gets incredibly costly for an organization and it's our professional opinion that it's not for much return on the dollar in doing so. And so what we have, is, is, as, as Todd was alluding to, was a job description questionnaire, and it doesn't matter the consulting firm they have, whether it's JDQ, PDQ, PAQ, whatever it's called, it's a document that takes employees systematically through the various elements that we would look for in our analysis, such as you know, thinking challenges, or what are the duties and responsibilities, or the educational requirements, and instead of an artificial window of time where employees, one, are naturally nervous, and two, um, it, it, you're trying to fit almost a square peg into a round hole in that you, you, you have insufficient time where an employee, if they were to do a JDQ, and it, because there are options for employees in this process, uh, they would have about a three week window to work on it one day, contemplate what they put down on paper, revise it, and, and, and work their way through that process. So we get a much better result coming back from the employees in, ter in terms of that JDQ. Alternatively, you know, we can work from completed job descriptions. And I know the city's invested some time over the course of the last several months to revise some of those job descriptions to say to an employee, go through this again with a fine tooth comb, and in this window of time, you have a choice of completing a JDQ or revising your job description with supervisory and human resources and administrative approval. So it's not just an arbitrary update, but at least giving them the opportunity to look and say, here's what we do, here's what we don't do, and, and getting that up to date. So it's, it's a written process, um, but as part of the overall project, we do meet with every single department head, um, depending on the size of the department. Some of those meetings are much longer than others and working our way through, and this is after we've evaluated each job, so we can ask for clarifications if necessary, but we can also dive into um, some challenges and problems that those departments are facing, whether it's internal or external from a um, competitiveness or internal equity standpoint. Perfect, and can you tell me what the letters J, D, Q actually Ab stand for? Absolutely, job description questionnaire. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Roberta. Jim, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, I'm looking over the uh, the agreement between the city and, and Carlson Detman. On page three of seven, under optional services C, it says, if client desires consultant to draft new or job revised job descriptions, Client will be invoiced at a rate of $125 per description. Uh, why isn't why wouldn't that be included in the in the fee? If I'm understanding what you're doing with going over job descriptions and that type of thing, and you you may be tweaking or making recommendations, why would there be an additional charge for that? Sure, that's a very good question, and it used to be part of our overall <coughs> proposal. You know, we, we set a fee for, per job. And about five, six years ago, we decided to remove it as kind of being intertwined with it because some clients don't want us revising their job descriptions. They want to do that on their own. The second part is that when we get a job description questionnaire back from an employer, 
Sometimes it's perfect, but more often than that, there's a lot of cleaning up that needs to be done to put it into a format that would be acceptable for a job description. We might have enough information to adequately assess the job from a point standpoint, you know, looking at our factors, thinking challenges and decision making and interactions, those sorts of things. So they might provide us enough information for that, but not enough information to really provide a quality job description back to the city. And so we find that there's a lot of follow up that occurs in those situations. And so that's why it's an extra fee and also allowing you the opportunity. In fact, I think even in our proposal, we identified that, you know, we like doing that work actually. I don't know that anybody really likes doing job descriptions to be perfectly honest, but at the same time, um, this is a, a task. In fact, I can tell you my first task out of college was hired as an intern to do job descriptions for the county that I eventually worked for. And so I, I, my recommendation is if that's something you wanna do, we're certainly willing and able to do it. If you have the time, you're certainly, you know, have the capability or, you know, hiring an intern to help you work through those would be substantially cheaper than what we would be able to do on, on the part of the city. And that's also why we put it as optional so you can make those assessments as you work your way through that process. Patrick, just to, just to expand on it a little bit and please correct me if I misstate something, but when, when, you're, when you and your team are done with the JDQs, that information will be given to the city so that we can make adjustments to the, the existing job descriptions. Actually, even one step further, since the documents come to us Correct. from the city, you have those in place already. Correct, and, that, and that's what I yep. mean. So basically, just to expand on Mr. Boren's um, statement is, it doesn't make sense to have the city, at least to some degree, have you rewrite them when we may just be adding some additional yep. information into the existing ones. Correct. Thank you. And one more. Uh, when you're going over when you're going over the various job descriptions and uh, and requirements, uh, how do you how do you look at the educational requirements of uh, you know for that position? Do you compare that to other municipalities what they're requiring? You know, for example, in the finance department, are requiring a CPA, or are you looking also for similar positions in the private sector? How does how do you go about evaluating that? So. So as it relates to you know, the educational requirements, when we look at a job, the, the first three factors of our, of our job evaluation system being thinking challenges that the employee is faced with, the decisions that they have to make, and then the interactions and communications, that usually tells us a ton about the intellectual horsepower, if you will, that's required to fill that job. And so if, and we also ask as part of our job description questionnaire, of the supervisor or the department head, if you were filling this job tomorrow, uh, what is the required education? And I always use the example, when I started this whole um, career of mine, almost 27 years ago, you know, the requirements to be a law enforcement officer were, was 30 college credits. Shortly thereafter, when I started, you know, it moved to 60 college credits. And so having an employee say what's required of you, you often miss the mark because jobs evolve, technologies change, you know, technology, just during the course of my career has been night and day. And so letting the JDQ first and foremost kind of lead you down that path. Um, but you, you hit on a couple points and it's exactly what we, we tend to look at. One, we're working in jobs every single day of, of our working career. And I'd say almost every single day of the week, um, you know, looking, or, looking at or thinking about jobs. Our surveys to which we subscribe, you know, the, the Towers, Watsons of the world, uh, comp data, so on and so forth. Each one of those for every job we look at, if there's a, if there's a match in, in those surveys, they give us a little paragraph and they say, you know, this job is typically filled by somebody with a high school diploma and four to five years of experience or a bachelor's. And so that helps inform us. But it, sometimes it's a matter of what is your preference? You know, sometimes organizations will say, you know what, we filled this position with an associate's degree for the last, you know, 10 vacancies we've had but this is getting more complex you know, we, we've added things to it. And so we might look at it and say the, that moving forward, you should look at it, you know, from the, through the lens of a bachelor's degree. The marriage of our observations and your hiring practices sometimes gets close and sometimes, you know, they go slightly in different directions. And the only time it really truly matters to us is when it's required by law. You know, you're not going to be an attorney without a law degree. So, you know, you keep going down, you know, you're not going to be a nurse without a nursing degree. You keep going down that list. And so we might look at it and say, this looks and feels everything you're asking. You're asking it to manage money, asking it to manage people. 
And so we think it rises to the level of, of a bachelor's level of education. But if your next applicant has an associate's degree and a little bit more experience behind them, again, it doesn't matter to us and it's gonna stay true in terms of the overall evaluation. But that's also why we, we try to make certain that the people who are looking at and evaluating our jobs or the, our clients' jobs have some experience. And so in this, this particular project, myself, I have um, 19 years of public sector experience working with a lot of these jobs. My associate, Heather Barber, was the Director of Human Resources for the City of Nina for 15 years. And so having worked with these and having seen these jobs time and time again also kind of gives us that feel for what's required. And then I guess the last piece is being fortunate enough to work with so many Wisconsin and other state municipalities on these sorts of projects, we really get a, a solid feel for how these jobs are beginning to evolve and, and the requirements for those particular jobs. Uh, one other one, uh, have you found in some of the, some of the uh, municipalities you've been working with the last couple of years that if the municipality is pretty well up to date on their technology, uh, have you, and maybe the job descriptions weren't, weren't real recent, and I presume ours are gonna be recent when you're looking at them, have you found that through the use of technology that maybe what used to be an eight hour workday is maybe now really only five and you, you can add something to that job description for new efficiencies and possibly downsize the manpower as a result of that? What I've seen in the public sector over the course of my career is, and this is where every time I've sold technology, and in my case I worked for county government in, in my career, that I've never sold it on the backs of we're gonna save people. I think maybe I did when it first came about. And the reality is that you always find something different for the person to do. So if we get more information out of a human resources information system or out of a accounting system, the expectation of the board or the citizens or the council in this particular case is that's great, but now we wanna do something with that information. And whether it's building those reports or actually taking action and so, of course, there's always the opportunities that as your technology improves it, that you find those efficiencies. And a lot of organizations might look at it from the standpoint of through attrition, you know, that we're not going to go through and cut people necessarily, even though I have seen a, a good example that would be, you know, in the water utility, you know, industry where it used to, you know, meter readers used to be the people who would walk from house to house. I don't need to spell it out for you. you you've dealt with that. But as we've gotten more and more technologically advanced, that job has kind of gone by the wayside in many communities because they're going to, you know, tower-based or, or electronic reading systems. So technology does has, have its, obviously has its place. And we do see sometimes jobs, if not being eliminated long-term, being repurposed. Thank you. I would like to just add a few, a, a couple of comments. Um, this program is not, uh, I, I don't want it to be misunderstood. The, the program of reviewing job descriptions and wage scales is not to eliminate positions. Absolutely. It is to make sure that we are becoming uh, an employer of choice and that we are balancing the cost and the benefit that the employees are providing the city. So it comes down to an operations review, a management review, that if there are positions that um, we find as technology improvements come in come into play that We can balance things better Then it's to the benefit of the employees. It's to the benefit of the city But this program is not to be understood that we are looking to um, Eliminate personnel at this point if I, if I may punctuate that statement because I think it's incredibly important for the work that we do that if and we do it organize, organizational analyses from time to time for clients but we never do them as part and parcel with one of these because if employees are, are looking at this sort of a process with the mindset of my job could potentially be on the line with this, we'll never get a straight answer out of employees. But that's not to say that if there was a situation where something just didn't make sense to us that we wouldn't bring it to the appropriate party's attention, you know, why, why is this going on or, or, or whatever, but in terms of saying, well, instead of five people in this department, you should only have four, or you should have six, that's for a different day and a different time. That okay. is correct. And this, we have good employees and we want to help them to yes. become better and more efficient. Chair, anything else? Does anyone else have other questions or comments? 
Hearing nothing, uh, a vote on the motion would be appropriate. All in favor of the resolution, state aye. 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 Anyone voting no? Chair votes aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Yep. Thank See you. In a couple weeks. All right, we'll move on to 3.5, which is an ordinance amending the municipal code to assign the statutory duties of either controller or comptroller, depending on your training, to the city administrator. Vicki, are you? Oh, no. No, no you're, oh, you're just. Uh, Todd, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the spirit of this is that the, um, since uh, since the finance director's position has been has been open is the focus on separation of duties and making sure that we have uh, personnel that can that are cross trained um, and also that we look at permissions from departments at all levels the comptroller's position and the treasurer's position in history has been separated and combined and I'm asking that we separate it but again um, for separation of duties, but that the comptroller's position, as I'm doing that at this time, would be, um, for future, would, would be moved into the city administrator's position. The, re the main spirit of that is the fact that it keeps the city administrator's position um, involved at a much higher level, um, meaning more, more activity, more involvement in the future, and that the future city, city uh, finance director's position would continue to be a finance director for operations, but would also have the responsibilities of the treasurer. And just to help everybody understand the treasurer's position, and Chuck can um, help correct me if I misstate it, but the, the treasurer's position is basically the incoming. Um, so, you know, when it comes to taxes, revenues, things like that, and working with the different funds that they go into. So if you think of it as the incoming um, uh, dollars into the city, the actual it's also a state statute position, so it has responsibilities and accountabilities from that perspective. The comptroller, which is traditionally separate from the treasurer's position, is basically the funds going out. So I work with the finance department on where, where's the money, where are the payments going, why, why are we paying this, how much are we paying this, and asking the questions and getting the information. So again, I'm, I'm asking that the comptroller position be added to the, respo to the responsibilities of the city, city, finance, uh, city finance, the city administrator's uh, position. Thank you. To get the discussion rolling, could I have a motion to uh, recommend adoption of the ordinance? So moved. So moved. Second. All right. Questions for Todd? Comments? I've got a question. Go ahead. Uh, if we are doing a comprehensive job description review, should we wait until that comprehensive review is finished before we change this particular job description? I and guess I have no problems waiting. Um, personally, I'm already doing this. Uh, these duties at this time, and I, I would just um, ask that the, um, the the committee would understand that this would be a change because of the organization, the way we have it structured for the city of Sheboygan. Not all municipalities are structured exactly the same. Um, we do have a city administrator mayoral uh, relationship, and my I guess the spirit that I'm bringing to the committee is the fact that I'm trying to put emphasis on the separation of duties and with the, with the organization that we have moving forward. And this forces the city administrator today and in the future to, to be intricately involved with uh, the finance department on the day-to-days and uh, the, the money movement. So if the, if the committee wants to wait, um, I'm still doing it as we, as we speak. If, if I may add something. Go ahead. So uh, I, I would have a problem if you delayed this. Um, you can always make another change. Um, 
reason I would have a problem if you did not change it is uh, if you don't change it, we are currently in violation of our ordinance because we we have, you know, it's the ordinance is set up uh, currently to have the treasurer and the comptroller in the same place. Uh, and we also have some issues with our bond sales and, and uh, we made some of our uh, documentation related to the bond sales sort of under the assumption that uh, this was going to go to you for uh, approval. You can always make a change uh, if you decide that you don't want this to be done anymore. Uh, uh, you can do that. Uh, the, uh, what I can tell you is that there is a little bit of a history. It used to be that we had a separate treasurer and comptroller uh, for, for many years. I mean, that, that was the, the history of the situation. And in, uh, in the state statutes, it's actually, the state statutes are designed with the assumption that you're going to have a separate treasurer and a separate controller. Uh, the city of Sheboygan moved to a uh, combined finance director uh, at some point. Uh, and, uh, at, at some, and when we originally had the first city, it wasn't called in the city administrator then at that point, but the first person who sort of filled that uh, role, we called the chief administrative officer. Uh, those roles were placed in him, but then some of the, the duties were uh, then moved to the finance director. Uh, then when uh, we sort of um, using words upgraded the position uh, to city administrator. I say using words because legally there really wasn't uh, uh, a change. Uh, there, there, the one, one of the things that happened is that sort of uh, all stayed within the finance department. Uh, there, there have been, you know, there's been some concern. I think uh, Todd has expressed some concern about whether we really want to have all of that consolidated uh, currently uh, and whether it's even uh, proper to have that all consolidated within a person who's doing a great job, but is a contract employee right now, not, you know, not a full, a full employee of the city. Uh, and, and I think that is a reasonable concern as well. And so what I, what I would suggest is that you do uh, approve that uh, today. Uh, and then if, as this process continues, it may be that we will identify an alternate way of doing things. Uh, but for now, let's have our, our ordinance match up with what we're actually doing. Jim, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, read, I read over this, this document and I fully support it. Uh, I, I just think it's, uh, it's just good business practice. I do have a question for Chuck. Uh, I noticed there's some bonding in there for the city administrator, Chuck. I believe it was $20 million. Uh, my question is two questions. How do you how do we come up with that amount? And number two, uh, is anybody else is there anybody else that should be bonded in the finance department? And I guess we probably have insurance for that uh, in case there would be any future uh, employee dishonesty. Uh, would you care to comment on that? The treasurer is bonded uh, because the treasurer is required to be bonded by state law. Uh, no, other people in the finance department don't necessarily need to be bonded because the treasurer uh, is in essence responsible for uh, uh, their employees. And so uh, if, if they permit their employees to do things that require, that, that cause a problem, they would be liable for that and the bond uh, that they hold would, would pay for that. Because we were moving this out of the, the controller position out of the finance department and separating it uh, from someone who would have, you know, direct uh, responsibility to the treasurer. I think the thought was to have an equivalent type of bonding uh, with the comptroller and, and, and that's the purpose for that. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Um, I'll just say that in my interactions with Todd since he um, became our city administrator, it's clear to me that having uh, this dual position really makes a tremendous amount of sense. It is another pair of eyes. It is another measure of accountability. And it's just plain old common sense. So I think that this, uh, uh, this does make a, a, a great deal of, uh, uh, of sense at this point. 
and if after our study is done, um, we want to look at different descriptions or whatever, we can do that. Any other comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Very good. All right, Vicki. Um, uh, 4.1 is the Human Resources Annual Report. Okay. Scott, can you pull my power? Thank you. I'm kind of in the blank screen. Uh, uh, Alders, the um, PowerPoint was sent to us earlier today, so if we can't get it up on the screen here. It was there before. It was there before, so we will. <laughs> but otherwise, you can follow along in your email. What do you think, Scott? Whenever I make a PowerPoint presentation, without exception, something goes wrong. Well, so. I can just begin. How's that? All right. It's on my, it, well, I'll, I'll just begin. Um, well, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak to you tonight. Um, Something magic is going to happen. Um, I have been in my position for just a year. I was notified on my Facebook uh, page that I celebrated a year with the city of Sheboygan in the role of the human resources director. So um, I just wanted to share with you all of the things that have happened in that very quick and tumultuous year as we have gone through uh, COVID, um, the CLA assessment, the, the, the uh, response to that assessment, as well as a lot of the pieces that we want to go through um, as what we have done and what we are planning to do in 2021. Oh, we're, we're doing something here. I'm gonna just wait. Honestly, it worked before. Scott is my witness, okay. All right, so I'm just, so for those of you who received the, the PowerPoint, then I'm just going to go through the slides. Um, I touched on the background, which would be slide number two, but wanting to draw your attention to the human, human resources staff, the slide number three. So you can see the current structure of our department we have uh, myself as the Director of Human Resources and Labor Relations. We have a payroll administrator. We have Denise Clark as our generalist. And we have a vacant position that had been held by our benefits administrator. Um, and we have an administrative services clerk too. So we have uh, almost 80% turnover in our department since uh, January of 2020. Um, because of various, like the response to the CLA report, but also in, in assessing what the needs of the department were and as we wanted to move forward. When I presented to you in May of 2020, oh, awesome, there we are. We're gonna go down. The strategic goals haven't changed since the last time I spoke to you. Um, because those are long range goals and we know that there's a lot of work to do within our department. So the first goal is to have the human resources department perform as a team of high functioning and trusted professionals. That has been something that we will continue to work on in years to come and will always be, I believe, one of our, our goals as a department. Uh, we also want to be a strategic and operational partner supporting all of the em employees and departments within the city of Sheboygan. I think that's an important piece for us to be able to share with you. And then our vision is to be, as Todd has frequently said, that employer of choice. And that's something that really starts with, with us in our department. We revised our, our core values a little bit in the, in the past year and these really do speak to what we want to do in our department as well, as how are we providing that excellent customer service to all uh, employees within the organization. That teamwork that we didn't necessarily have when I first entered into the role, but has really continued to grow as we've uh, grown as a team. Uh, one of the pieces that I think is, is a, an important part of culture change is to assume the good 
that assume the good in each other, that we're not looking to, to find fault with one another because there's so much work that needs to be done, but we're looking to do things that are supportive of one another. Um, as we go through accountability, we know that there's a lot of work that we have to do in the department to fulfill that, that goal. Um, we're looking to be a learning environment, supporting training, um, being respectful, and being responsible stewards of our, of our people and of our financial resources. And entwined in all of that is communication, as we know that we, as a department, and I know personally we need to do a better job of communicating our, our goals and everything that we need to do, and that's important in everything that we do. So what have we gone through? It's been something. Um, so I started as the interim director in March, and so I'm going to speak from that point moving forward. The day after I started, we had a state of emergency declared by Governor Evers for COVID, which was an amazing journey that, that you'll see later on in the slides. Um, in April, City Administrator Daryl Hoffland announced his retirement. We had, uh, again, we presented a collaborative response from the finance, uh, IT, and personnel uh, uh, and human resources uh, departments to you as the F finance and personnel committee. Um, in May, then, I was approved and appointed as the director of human resources. So again, I thank you for your trust in me in this role in the past year. We started a search for the new city administrator in May and June. and. Uh, as you all know, Todd Wolf became the new city administrator in early July. Uh, shortly after he began, we hit the ground running with a lot of different things within the department. That very first week, we had a, a strategic planning meeting so that we could look at the reorganization of our department as well as the finance department. Um, we had some shifting within the finance and human resources, and we had uh, uh, the accounts payable a uh, clerk had retired. We had a purchasing or payroll backup accounts payable person moved over from HR into finance. We hired a new clerk. So we had a lot of shifting. We also had the release of one of our employees and actually two employees in the human resources department within that time frame. So it was a, a challenging time for all of us, a very tumultuous time, but also one that had, was very hopeful with, with the direction that Todd was setting. Uh, we established weekly departmental meetings for the staff. We had a payroll assessment by Baycor, um, which was to really improve and look at that process, which is a continuing initiative, as you'll hear later on. Um, we were looking at how we do a PCN process, which seems very simple, but we had five different forms for a, for a a process which should have just required one, and then as we went through it, we discovered that Munis probably could have done it all for us all along. So it's a learning that we're doing um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And let's see. So we're continuing through the year, we had uh, another change in the department in August. So we we have had a, a tumultuous year with with um, restructuring and finding the right people. Uh, in the right seats. We did review all the, the non-represented job descriptions in September and October so that we could go into our performance evaluations and be able to, uh, to do that well. We brought on uh, Denise Clark as our new HR generalist in October. We had uh, her very first week, she remembers, that we did employee recognition. So we went to all the departments and provided lunch for everybody. Um, we hit all the departments as best we could, um, and that was probably one of the most fun things we've done in, in a bit. Uh, we went through open enrollment as that was our norm for uh, October. We did our performance evaluation uh, process. We reviewed and changed the format that, for that experience, and I think that that will continue to change as we use MUNIS and the modules that are there. Um, and then again, in December, uh, at the end of the year, we did have another staff change, which was, a, 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 and again, a critical moment for us. We had, <clears throat> right in the middle of year end, we had uh, the team pulled together for, uh, for a lot of pieces that needed to be accomplished in December, January, February, and actually even into the current sta status of where we are. So I wanted to share with you, um, besides the timeline, some of the stats that uh, we've pulled together as far as where we are as an organization. Uh, when I pulled the report, 
we had uh, 455 employees. And looking back at our turnover rate is about 11%, which is less than the national average, which is approximately 20 to 25%. So in, um, you can see from 2016 to 2020, we've had a growth in separations. And those separations include retirements, resignations, and terminations. So we have ha seen a growth in uh, resignations, obviously, and we had 10 terminations in 2020. That was more than the previous four years combined um, in, in terminations. So we are making changes within the culture of the city, and sometimes those changes are necessary and good. Um, we are seeing an increase in retirees, I believe, as baby boomers are, are reaching that age. And so I think this is a trend that we have seen more, more retirees in the fire department and police department and in DPW. And as we have had 25, 30-year uh, tenured employees that are, are reaching retirement age. This is our 2021 health benefit premium costs just so that you have that as a, as a reference point. Um, in 2020, we decided together that we would try to hold the premium cost at 8.5% for employees. We had at one point looked at going up as high as 9%, but with COVID and with the, with the uh, hardships that families were having, we really wanted to try to hold that line as to be as, um, as employee friendly as we could. Um, the next slide is uh, an, uh, just a depiction of our health costs over the past four to five years. Our costs went down significantly in 2020, as you can see on that very first line, <clears throat> and that's due to COVID. People were not getting their procedures done. People were not going to the doctor as frequently, and so that trend is pretty normal across the board. Uh, we have, so our cost per employee, as you can see, is also going down. I do expect that in 2021, our costs will go higher. I'm not sure exactly what that might mean at this point, but um, if you see the asterisk on the bottom, that in January, we've already hit uh, our, um, our stop loss, which is at 91%. Now that'll fluctuate as people use the use their benefits and, um, and go through the year. That can change significantly, but we know that a lot of people were holding on to waiting till January to go to their doctor or get prescriptions refilled. Um, these slides, I think, also demonstrate the impact of COVID on the, not only on uh, the community, but on the human resources department. So we had offered three different levels of COVID leave. Two were based by the federal government and one was based on the city. So um, you can see in the, oh, oh, there it is. The chart on the left um, shows that we had 230 unique employees who had taken or used some kind of COVID leave um, over the course of, from March till the end of the year. Uh, and that resulted in about $286,000 of value that the city or was provided, hopefully either will be refunded through some of the CARES Act dollars. So the, the first pie chart is the COVID sick leave, which was uh, the, a federal program that allowed people to take leave if they had to care for a child, if there was all kinds of different uh, reasons that somebody might have to quarantine. So there were different stipulations. Every department was affected by that program. And you can see the different departments and the, and the dollar amounts that were um, affected by that. Uh, COVID FML is the second pie chart. The chart on the left stays the same through my, some, through my slides, so you can use that as a reference. The, the chart on the right is um, the federal government overlapped FML or COVID FML over the top of normal FML. And so this is a reflection of those who were able to use that. And then on the third pie chart, this is the one that I think is significant to you as council members, uh, that this is the, the, the outreach that the city did to invest in keeping the employees whole because these employees, and it's about um, 
$90,000. These were employees who could not work remotely, but could not also be at work for uh, whatever reason. And they were, they were at risk of being furloughed. So the city of Sheboygan kept these people whole by, by offering this COVID LOA. And so that, that involved, um, for example, library pages, some transit employees, the custodian for the senior center, for example. And I will, so moving ahead to where we are um, in 2021, we've gone through the Munis upgrade, which was uh, completed at the end of February. We know that the Human Resources Department has a lot of work to do with understanding and implementing the Munis modules so that we can be more efficient and uh, provide better services. Uh, we are, as uh, we have Patrick Glynn here, we're doing the start of the, um, the, the review of our compensation and classifications. Um, we, we did our wage increases and the benefits, even though we were um, in, a, in a learning mode with the benefits administrator no longer being with the city. Uh, we had a CLA audit of our benefits administration and payroll processes. We just finished that up about a week ago and we'll be reviewing that, their results um, tomorrow. We had a successful negotiation and adoption of the firefighter union contract. We partnered with LTC to support an intern in human resources and she'll, she's been an awesome asset for us and she'll be leaving us at the end of this month. Uh, we have anticipated our updated and distribution of our revised handbook. I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that in April. Uh, we're working with a consultant to determine and implement our strategic plan for our department. So we, on Wednesday of this week, we will be spending a day looking at the team and our roles and what else we can do to make sure that we are moving in, in the correct direction. We are advertising now for an HR generalist and so we'll be bringing someone on board hopefully shortly. Um, and then we just recently did the employee recognition for years of service and those who have retired in, the, in 2020. So there's a lot of things that are going on in spite of COVID and uh, <clears throat> and uh, just to spite COVID in some ways. <laughs> so any questions for me? Questions or comments for Vicki? Todd. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to tell the committee um, how proud I am of, of Vicki and her team. You know, I, I joke too often, I know Mary Lynn, but I joke uh, from time to time and say that, you know, the worst time to be a city administrator is, you know, during COVID, during budget, um, but, you know, to, to extend the helping hand, Vicki has done a phenomenal job coming in during a very tough time. Um, you know, none of us knew what was gonna happen when COVID um, happened back in March. Um, the rules, the regulations, the guidance, uh, the uniqueness of the situation for our, our employees, for their families, for their children has been just unprecedented. And then you mix in the fact that you've got a new city administrator with high expectations coming in, um, stirring the pot per se. So I, I compliment uh, Vicki and her team. And, you know, I'm hopeful that everybody in the council will continue to support the many changes that we are doing within the city to make it a uh, an employer of choice, but understanding that we're just getting started and there's a lot of remodeling that needs to be done. We're not just changing the way we do things, we're changing the culture in how we we perceive things, how we operationally do our, our performances, and how we provide the services for our, our, our constituents. Thank you. Jim, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to bring uh, the, uh, the committee's attention an interesting article that I saw in the Municipality Magazine back in November of 2020. And it has to do with quite a few cities around the state are offering financial incentives for their employees to live in the city. Uh, back a few years ago, the, uh, the state of Wisconsin decided that residency could no longer be required but quite a few municipalities feel it's important for as many of their employees to live in the city where they work as possible. So I pass that on to Vicki and I pass it on to Todd and I know they're very busy. 
but it might be something that they, that they might want to take a look at. Uh, the latest data that Vicki gave me about a week ago, at that time she mentioned 450 employees, and out of the 450 city employees, we now have 244 living in the city, and we have two, 206 living outside the city. So this would be, you know, totally voluntary when we're hiring somebody or the existing employees if they wanted to come up with some type of an incentive program to encourage our employees to live in, in, in the wonderful city of Sheboygan. Thanks. Any other comments, questions? Very good, Vicki, thank you. That was just right. so helpful. All right, thank um, you very much. You've done an amazing job in one year. and, and you've, That's very kind of you, thank you. And you've got a terrific team, so congratulations. Um, that is the end of our agenda. Our next meeting is April 12th. I assume we'll mostly be here. And with that, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All right. All in favor, state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.